Just over a week ago, I posted a video where I answered questions about Canon cameras. This week, it's Nikon's turn. So if you've got a Nikon camera, this video is for you. Welcome to the Photo Genius channel. Hi, Paul here from Photo Genius. Welcome to my channel where I post regular photography tutorials, I share tips and tricks, occasionally I do gear reviews, and sometimes I do Q&A videos just like this one. And today's video is all about Nikon. I'm gonna try and answer all your Nikon questions, um, and there are quite a lot that were posted to the YouTube channel, so with no time to waste, let's get into it. Now I did get a couple of questions about focus stacking, one from Stanford70 and one from Steve Boys, who's a regular viewer. How are you doing, Steve? Um, focus stacking is um, a technique that I probably will cover on a separate video, but to give you a basic idea of how, how it works, it's often used by macro photographers and sometimes used by um, landscape photographers as well. Let me give you an idea. Let's say I'm doing a landscape and in the foreground I have some rocks in the mid ground I have, let's say, a waterfall, and in the background, in the distance, I've got some mountains. Now, as some of you will probably know, trying to get all three of those elements in focus is a, a real challenge. Well, focus stacking works like this. You focus on the rock in the foreground, you take a picture, you focus on the mid ground, the waterfall, you take a picture, you focus on the background, the mountains, you take a picture. And then using software, you stack the images together so that you get a really deep, long, extended depth of field. So everything is nice and sharp. I mean, in a nutshell, that's roughly how this works. Now with some cameras, it can actually be done in camera, but generally you use additional software. Um, Stanford for 70, you've got a D3300. Steve, you've got a D3500. Um, so what I think I might do is, if there's enough interest, and please let me know by commenting below, I think I will do a separate video on this subject where I'll show you the process of taking the photos and also editing them. Because it's a big subject and I don't really think I can do it justice in this short Q&A video. But I hope that helps for now. Moving on to the next question, and Emily M has a Nikon D3500 and wants to know what is the best lens to do wildlife photography with? Now there are many different lenses out there, so what I've done is come up with a few suggestions for you. So I've chosen five budget telephoto lenses to consider. Now please note these prices will be in US dollars. First up is the Nikon AFP 70 to 300 millimeter telephoto lens. At around $350, this is a great value lens for cropped DX sensors. Now for around an extra $50, you can get a VR version. Now VR stands for vibration reduction, and this would be my choice of the two. Now Sigma make lenses that will also fit Nikon cameras and they have an 18 to 300 millimeter telephoto zoom with image stabilization for around $580. But also check out this Tamron lens. Now this is around $600, but it will give you a longer focal length of up to 400 millimeters. Fantastic for wildlife and it's just a few dollars more than the Sigma. Now stretching the budget a little bit more, but getting a great quality lens, check out the Sigma 100 to 400 millimeter. This is priced around $800. And I really hope, Emily, there's something there for you amongst these recommendations. The next question was all about the Nikon D5200. How is it in 2021 and how does it stack up against some of the newer, more expensive Nikons? So firstly, let's start with the, the age of the camera. The D5200 came out in 2013, which means at the time of making this video, it's about eight years old. And technology moves and evolves quite quickly in the world of photography. So what I did is I looked at the specs and compared them with Nikon's current an entry level DSLR camera, which is the Nikon D3500. And I did that because this is a really great camera. It's absolutely amazing. Now, 
spec, um, comparing the specs, what was really interesting was the specs were almost exactly the same. So the D5200 would have sat a bit higher in the range at the time, it wasn't the entry level camera, but all that technology is now filtered down to this camera. So I don't know if you've already, you already own the D5200 or you're thinking of buying one, but if you are thinking of buying one and it's in good condition because it's likely to be second hand of course, I would go for it because it's actually better than this in terms of the features. Um, for example, it's got a, an older processor, but not by much. X-Speed 3 processor, X-Speed 4 processor. I don't think that's a big deal breaker. Focus points in the D5200, there are 39 focus points compared with the D3500's 11. Um, LCD screen. LCD screen on this camera is fixed, but on the D5200, you can actually articulate the screen, you can flip it out, reverse it, and so on. And I think that's a great feature. Uh, what else? Mic input. If you're gonna do video as well as take photos, the D5200 has a mic input, whereas the D3500 doesn't. So I just think that was interesting to see that in eight years, um, these cameras are actually quite comparable, but the D5200 actually has some still pretty neat features that will set it apart from the current entry-level cameras. So you also asked how will it compare to more expensive Nikon cameras? Well, of course, if you're gonna spend more money, you're gonna get more bells and whistles, you're gonna get more features. Now, again, I don't know from your very limited question, um, what your budget is, what situation you're in, if you already own a camera, if you're upgrading, I really don't know. But of course, if you can spend a bit more, you are gonna get a bit more in terms of functionality. Um, so I hope that helps. The next question comes from May Hume, who's struggling a bit in manual mode, using a Nikon D5600, comfortable by the sounds of things with aperture priority, but struggling with manual. Well, look, to begin with, this isn't a tutorial video. Of course, this is a Q&A video, but I still wanna try and help you. So the first thing I would recommend is to watch my video, which is all about controlling exposure, and I'll put a link up here so you can check it out. But um, actually, to get you started, let me just give you some pointers. This is a Nikon D3500 and we can clearly see the current shutter speed, aperture and ISO settings on the LCD screen. Now the first thing I'm going to do is to change the ISO to my preferred default which is 200. Remember where possible, ISO keep it low. Now the camera's light meter is currently indicating overexposure. So to fix this, I'm going to increase the shutter speed by turning the dial on the top of the camera. The faster shutter speed means less light will be recorded. And as a result, you can see the meter adjusting. Aim for zero for a balanced exposure. If you would like to learn more about exposure, then use the link below to watch my video exposure for beginners. Are second-hand lenses any good compared to buying a new one? Well, look, I've done lots of photography workshops here in Brisbane, and many times people have brought along lenses that they've bought second-hand. Lenses can be sometimes hideously expensive, but to be fair, you do get what you pay for. When it comes to lenses, if you could spend a little bit more money, it is really worth it. But of course, there's lots of people out there that get into photography, they buy expensive gear, and then they just don't use it. So it ends up on the secondhand market. So look, by all means, go out there and see what there is, because you can pick up some really good bargains. Just be really careful that the lens hasn't been overly you know, used and battered and not looked after. So try and make sure that the glass is as clear and pristine as possible. Just try and make sure that the, the zoom and the focus doesn't feel sticky. Put it on your camera, do a few test shots, and hopefully you'll pick up a bargain. Joseph is asking, what brand of camera is easier to learn the basics on? Now, if I'm totally honest with you, I don't really think it matters too much. I see lots of different cameras when I'm doing my courses and workshops here in Brisbane. I see people with Nikons, Canons, Fujifilm cameras, Sony, and they all do pretty much the same thing. Of course, the buttons are gonna be in different places, but once you've got your head around that, 
pretty much everything's the same. Aperture, shutter speed, ISO, all those essentials that you need to understand to take good photos are pretty much the same regardless what camera you've got. Um, I mean, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a big Nikon fan and a Nikon user, but I also use Canon cameras as well. And look, I have to be honest here. I think looking at the Nikons versus the Canons, I do find sometimes that from a beginner perspective, the Canon cameras may slightly have the edge because I do like the layout of the buttons and usually it's quite easy to navigate around the camera. And then again, this is coming from somebody who's posting a video about Nikons and also is a big Nikon shooter. So, but look, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever you end up with, the key thing is to just get out of auto, get into manual, watch some of my videos, learn the basics and have fun with your camera. Hope that helps, Joseph. Now Mike's question is all about removing the memory card while the camera is still turned on. Is it going to damage his Nikon camera? Well, of course, generally speaking, if you're going to remove the memory card from the camera, likewise, if you're going to take the battery out, it is ideal that you turn the camera off. But having said that, I'm pretty sure in the past I've taken the memory card out without turning the camera off and I don't think it should be a major issue, if at all. But what I would say, however, it's not a good idea to remove the memory card while the camera's still writing information to the card. So sometimes when you're taking photos, particularly with long exposures, you might on some cameras see a light on the back of the camera, or sometimes um, busy will come up on the LCD screen. This means the camera is still busy doing something, and it's almost certainly writing information to the memory card. Then, if you remove the card, I do think there is um, a chance that you may probably um, damage the card or damage the files being written to the card. Maybe not so much the camera. Again, no guarantees on this, but generally speaking, if you can, turn that camera off next time. Next up, David Mill is asking about the benefits of upgrading from a Nikon D5600, which is a DSLR, to the Nikon Z50, which is a mirrorless camera. Now there are, to be fair, quite a few reasons why that would be a good upgrade. Firstly, you're um, upgrading to a mirrorless camera, which of course is the future. Now the great thing about the mirrorless system that Nikon have put together is you can, with an adapter, use your existing lenses. So if you already have a small collection of lenses, you'll be able to use them on the Z50 as long as you use the, the adapter, and that's called the FTZ adapter. There is a new version of that, it's FTZ2. Uh, other advantages, um, newer processor, Xspeed 6, as opposed to Xspeed 4 in the 5600. Um, uh, focus points, 39 on your current DSLR, 209 on the Z50. See, with the mirrorless cameras, you get a lot more focus points and they're pretty much covering the entire frame as well. And that's a big, big plus. Um, frames per second, five frames per second with the D5600, 11 on the, Z50, on the Z50. So that's more than double. So if you do like taking photos of sports and moving subjects, again, that jump to mirrorless would be, would be a good move. Um, I mean, look, D5600, it's been around a while, still a good DSLR camera, but the future is mirrorless, and the Z50 is a great camera. Next up, Natalie is asking for a lens recommendation to add to her existing kit, which is a D3400 and the 18 to 55 millimeter lens. Photographing food, but on a budget. Well, I think there's just two lenses to recommend here. They're both prime lenses, and I would check out the 50 millimeter F 1.8G and also the 35 millimeter F 1.8G. So they're both prime lenses, which means you're gonna lose the zoom, but that won't be an issue. What you're gonna gain is the wide aperture. F1.8 is considerably wider than the current kit lens is allowing you. And uh, what that's gonna do is, of course, it's gonna perform better in low light, but also, and I think this is gonna be key for you, is it's gonna allow you to create a very shallow depth of field, so the food is nice and sharp, and anything in the background will soften and blur. They're both very popular lenses. Uh, generally, the 50 millimeter is a bit cheaper than the 35. I really love the 35, I've got one here. Uh, this I've had for many years, it's had lots of use, so it is looking quite worn and battered, but it's a, great, it's a really great lens. So those would be my two lenses to recommend to you. 
So this next question is about changing ISO on the Nikon D3500. So let me show you first the camera that came before the D3500, which was the D3400. Now with this camera, you've got two ways of changing the ISO. You can press the I button and change it via the rear screen, but there is also a function button on the side, which is really handy because if I hold it down and turn the dial on the back of the camera, I'm actually changing the ISO. So this is what I like to call a shortcut and this is really handy. Now for some unknown reason, the upgrade to that camera, which was the D3500, is very similar, but they, um, they dropped the function button. So now there's no shortcut for changing ISO. You have to press the I button, navigate through the, the options on the back of the screen and change it that way. So it is a bit slower. I don't know why this uh, Nikon chose to do this because t usually when you bring out a new camera, it has all the functions that the previous camera had plus some more. It was a strange decision, but there you go. Um, anyway, so bearing in mind the ISO on this camera is a little trickier to change. The other part of the question was, should I use auto ISO? Now, I'm not a huge fan of auto ISO unless I'm taking photos in a situation where maybe I, um, you know, speed is of the essence. Um, sports photography would be a good example. And that's when I might want the camera to just play around a bit with the ISO on my behalf. So um, I'm not a big fan of auto ISO. What I would suggest is if you are gonna try using auto ISO, maybe limit it. So the camera will control the ISO, but it will only go up to a limit. It won't push it too high because a higher ISO is gonna make your pictures noisy, which is why you often hear in my videos me saying, ISO, keep it low. So um, I'll show you how to set the um, ISO settings on this camera. To find the ISO settings, press the menu button, then go to the shooting menu. From here, look for ISO sensitivity settings, and here you can turn auto ISO on. But you can also limit the ISO by setting the maximum sensitivity. So here, for example, I'm choosing 1600 as my maximum ISO. So now the camera will automatically adjust the ISO, but only in the range between 100 and 1600 ISO max. So this next question is a camera upgrade. Looking to upgrade from the D3400. Well, firstly, I would say don't move on to the D3500. That doesn't mean it's not a good camera, but it's not a huge upgrade. There is very, very little difference. So I don't think it will be worth it. Assuming that you wanna stick with a DSLR camera, my recommendation, and it's gonna cost a bit more money, would be the 7500. So the D7500 is a worthy upgrade and will give you more functionality. One of the things you'll notice straight away with that camera is it's a bigger body, so it's, it's better to hold. It's got more controls, so you can change functions uh, very quickly. For example, unlike the smaller cameras like the D3400, there's only the one control dial. On the 7500, there's a dial on the front for the aperture, a dial on the back with the shutter speed. So you can change things very, very quickly. There's also function buttons that you can um, set to change whatever you like, like white balance, ISO, etc. Uh, with the 7500, you get 51 focus points compared to 11 in your current camera. And again, that's quite an upgrade. Also with the current camera, five frames per second. If you're upgraded to the 7500, you're gonna get eight frames per second. Plus, and this is gonna be very useful if you wanna do videos as well, you've got a mic input and you've got a headphone input. Two things, again, that are missing from the entry-level cameras. So that's something I would consider. Of course, the other thing you should consider is moving on to a mirrorless camera, bearing in mind that the DSLRs are now slowly being phased out. And my recommendation, if you were looking for a mirrorless camera, would be to look at the Z50. Now, I do also feel that we may see a cheaper entry-level mirrorless camera from Nikon in the near future. So that's something to also consider. So here asking if you can recharge the Nikon D3500 using USB. Well, unfortunately, no. And that's the case with most of the Nikon DSLR cameras, unlike the mirrorless cameras, where this is fast becoming a standard feature. So unfortunately, with the D3500, there is no USB charging. My recommendation is to buy a second battery. 
This next question is about upgrading from a DSLR camera, currently the D3500, to a mirrorless camera. And there's three cameras under consideration, the Nikon Z50, the Z5, and the ZFC. For now, let's just push the ZFC aside and let's talk about the Z50 versus the Z5. Now, two great cameras, both mirrorless, both using the same Z mount, which is uh, the future, of course, for Nikon, but the Z50 is a crop sensor camera and the Z5 is a full frame camera. So which camera I'm going to recommend is largely going to be based on what you like to take photos of. Now if you like taking photos in low light and if you like doing landscapes, maybe architecture, um, then the Z5, the full frame camera, may well be the best option because it's pretty well known that uh, with a larger um, sensor the cameras perform better in lower light so that would be my recommendation um, if however you're looking for shooting moving subjects uh, such as wildlife and sports kids at play that kind of thing then the z50 may be better a um, couple of reasons the main one being that it could shoot at 11 frames per second which is more than double what the Z5 can do at 4.5 frames per second. Secondly, with the Z50, because it's a crop sensor camera, when you put a lens on it like a telephoto, effectively that telephoto lens is extended. So you get that extra zoom reach, which of course is very popular with sports photographers and uh, wildlife photographers. Now in terms of focusing points, there's not a huge difference here. 209 on the Z50 versus 273 on the Z5. So, that would be my, my thing to consider really. What do I want to use the camera for? Because they're both great cameras. Um, Z5 performing better in low light, but being maybe a little bit slower in performance. The Z50 being a bit more zippy and faster in performance. But of course it is still a crop sensor camera, which you would be used to of course with the, um, the D3500. Now, assuming that you did decide to go for the Z50, now let's talk about the difference between the Z50 and the ZFC. Well, I've mentioned this in a separate video. I'll pop a link up here, it is worth checking out. I've got the ZFC, I'm using it to record this video, so I can't actually show it to you, and it's a great camera. But the biggest difference between the Z50 and the ZFC is, is really in the styling. I really like the retro styling of the ZFC, which is why I got it. Um, the Z50 is a very similar camera. Of course, there's a few other differences as well, and I'll cover those in the video. But if you are deciding to go for the crop sensor mirrorless camera, and it's literally between the Z50 and the ZFC, it may just come down to the look and the handling, yeah, because pretty much the features are exactly the same. I hope that helps. So I'd like to say thank you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video where I tried to answer as many questions as possible without this video getting too long. I'd like to say a special thank you, of course, to those of you who took the time to post a question. Now, if you did enjoy this video, it really helps me and the channel if you give it a like. Please consider hitting that like button. Also, make sure you're subscribed because I try to put out new videos every single week. And of course, you don't want to miss out on future videos. That's pretty much it other than say thanks for watching. Hope to see you again sometime soon. See ya. Bye.